Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're discussing that barbaric vestige of uncontrollable ignorance and sadism, capital punishment. Our guest is Alexandra Klein. Professor Alexandra Klein researches and teaches in the area of criminal law, criminal procedure, constitutional law, and the death penalty. Her scholarship has been published in or is forthcoming in the Ohio State Law Journal, the Florida Law Review, and the Washington and Lee Law Review. Her recent article in The Nation magazine is called A Few Words for the Firing Squad. In the Washington and Lee Law Review in March, she published The Beginning of the End, Abolishing Capital Punishment in Virginia. Alexandra Klein, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for the work you're doing. So what is this about firing squads? That sounds like something out of a different era. Well, it does, but also it isn't. Um, so the firing squad has been part of the history of capital punishment in the United States. Um, in fact, the first execution in the U.S. was by firing squad. Um, the state that has used the firing squad most consistently throughout U.S. history is Utah. Um, their most recent firing squad execution was actually in 2010. So what's happening, why, why the firing squad is coming back in the news though, is that South Carolina is out of lethal injection drugs. Um, and their prior statute required execution by either electrocution or lethal injection with lethal injection as the default. So the, the prisoner who was sentenced to death got to choose between lethal injection or electrocution. And if he didn't choose, then he would get lethal injection. Okay, but South Carolina has apparently been out of the drug since 2013. And they have three people who uh, I believe have kind of completed all appeals and are said to could be executed, um, but they don't have the drug. So South Carolina recently changed its method of execution statute to give condemned people a choice between electrocution, lethal injection, if the drugs are available, or the firing squad, um, with the default method being electrocution. And in practice, it's really looking like it's going to be a choice between the firing squad and the electric chair because they don't have the drug. Um, so that's... It, it still exists, right? It's been used consistently. Um, yeah. It just seems, I think, more barbaric to us because we're not used to it as much around the United States, right? Although other states have authorized it. Um, Mississippi and Oklahoma, for example. But in terms of what's known about the pain and suffering, at least in some cases, from electrocution and from lethal injection, uh, it seems the firing squad m may cause less suffering. So this sort of more humane methods turn out to mean easier to do for the people doing the killing. Is, is that right? I, I definitely think, well, there's been great scholarship on um, the pain and suffering associated with possible firing squad executions rather than say lethal injection. So from a pain standpoint, it's possible that the firing squad is less painful. I mean, we just don't know, right? Um, Most of the witnesses are dead. Well, 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 I mean, the witnesses see it, right? But the, the person who experiences it is definitely not going to be able to tell us about it. Um, and what we know about lethal injection is that it, it can be pretty horrific um, and, and electrocution as well. So theoretically less painful, um, but I'm not convinced, uh, and much of my scholarship addresses this, I, I'm not convinced that pain is the whole story in terms of the Eighth Amendment. Sure. And and who who will participate? How many people and where will they get them in Utah or in South Carolina for these firing squads? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so South Carolina hasn't developed its protocol yet. The Department of Corrections is working on it. But South Carolina might, like a lot of states when faced with capital punishment decisions, look at how other states have carried out these executions. And the legislators mentioned looking at Utah's protocols. And how Utah does it is it relies on volunteer, the statute says peace officers, in practice that's been police officers, from the jurisdiction where the crime took place. You need five executioners under the statute. They usually have, they have practices, they have training, um, and they have to qualify. 
and as you know, expert marksmen, so that they can actually hit the target um, and not cause the person intense suffering. Um, so these the the Utah executioners are police officers from the jurisdiction where the crime took place, and Utah still follows the practice of having one of the the five rifles that they use contain a blank, um, so that theor or a, an ineffective round, so that the, I guess theoretically the executioner can say, well, I didn't know for sure. Right. But there could be cases, perhaps there already have been cases, where police officers in a neighborhood making an arrest uh, end up killing uh, the person they've arrested, not with a knee on the neck on the scene, but later after a, a judicial process, right? We don't actually know precisely. Executioners are granted total anonymity by every single jurisdiction, gives them total anonymity. So the officers who have, um, there have been a handful of officers who've spoken to in interviews, right, about their experiences on the firing squad, but we don't know who they are. Um, we don't know whether they're screened out for involvement in the case. It's, it's possible, um, but state death penalty, most death penalty processes are so secretive that we don't actually know. I wonder, do you, there may be, I, I'm sure there are no uh, great bodies of research on this, but do you have any indications what the, the videos and the protests of Black Lives Matter, the awareness of police killings on the street, uh, and on the other hand, the, the development in U.S. foreign policy of, of blowing up individuals with missiles more than widespread warfare, what impacts, if any, these have on public opinion about capital punishment? And, and what is public opinion on capital punishment? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that the connection about the connections between, you know, protest movements and, and response to police killing of, of unarmed black people um, in, in ways that sometimes looks an awful lot like uh, a sort of spontaneous on the street execution. Um, but I do know that sentiment around capital punishment in the U.S. has declined somewhat, certainly since the 90s. Um, you know, in the, the 60s and the 70s, the, the, the sentiment against capital punishment had declined substantially, I mean, extremely low. And then it kind of returned over the 80s and the 90s. And now it seems to be starting to decline again, um, with a few states in recent years having actually abolished the death penalty. And, and historically, going back a couple of centuries, uh, or not that much, uh, it, it was a it was a public spectacle. It was something to be advertised and watched, uh, and it became something done in secret and done with less less violence and less blood. And uh, I, I mean, it, do you think that the firing squad approach uh, will have any impact on how people think of capital punishment? I'm not sure. Um, you know, we had uh, th there have been. It's possible that a more violent, more brutal execution can certainly change minds. Um, that was part of the move away from hanging, right? Botched hangings are pretty unpleasant. Uh, someone either strangles to death or is potentially decapitated. Um, so we switched to the electric chair as this idea of it sort of being more technological and more humane and more science driven. And the electric chair um, sets people on fire a lot. Um, in court, right. in, in the, the Supreme Courts of Nebraska and Georgia actually held it unconstitutional under their state constitution because of this pervasive risk of someone catching on fire. Yeah. We've had botched lethal injections in recent years that got quite a lot of public attention as they deserved to have. Um, so I think brutality certainly can drive sentiment away from capital punishment. Um, and it's possible that the firing squad is so graphic and so violent that it, it may steer opinion away from it, but it's, it's very difficult to say. Capital punishment's in a very strange place. We don't execute, there are fewer and fewer death sentences imposed. Um, we don't execute as many people anymore, um, but we still have it. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Alexandra Klein, the, the gas chamber was also a humane U.S. innovation that then was uh, used uh, more dramatically in Nazi Germany and perhaps picked up a bad name 
uh, from that history. Um, isn't that right? It's possible that, that the use of gas certainly, I mean, it, it's hard not to read about the gas chambers, gas chamber executions, and immediately think about the use of gas in mass atrocity, right, in the Holocaust. Um, but gas executions did continue in the United States even after the Holocaust had happened. Um, I'm trying to think when the last one was, I, maybe in the 90s? Really, that late, huh? Execution, we don't like to think about, I, I think socially we don't like to think about capital punishment as much, right? We like to think about someone who's done something terrible, getting what we think they deserve, we like to think a lot about finality, but we don't like to really sit down and think about who's getting executed and how they're doing it and how the state is killing someone. Or about cases of, of innocence, uh, wrongly, uh, if there can be rightly executed. There have been cases uh, reported in recent months, even uh, of happening, having happened in years gone by, of DNA suggesting that, that people have been wrongly executed, right? Yeah, the most recent news was on Liddell Lee, who was executed in Arkansas in, I believe, 2011. Um, they, post-execution uh, DNA testing, found someone else's DNA on the murder weapon. And while that isn't enough to conclusively exonerate yet, um, it certainly raises a lot of questions, right, about Mr. Lee's conviction and execution. Um, similarly, the, there have been a couple of cases out of Texas that have pretty good documentation, certainly suggesting innocence. Um, Carlos De Luna and uh, uh, someone named Cameron Todd Willingham. Um, there's a great book called um, The Wrong Carlos about Mr. De Luna's case that discusses pretty conclusively in my view, fairly conclusively, that DeLuna may have been wrongfully executed. Yeah, there certainly have been quite a few very questionable cases and near misses where people have been exonerated in time. Um, the, we're speaking with Alex Klein, whose Nation article recently uh, was called A Few Words for the Firing Squad. I just, uh, within 20 minutes uh, before starting this interview, I got an email from an anti-death penalty organization uh, warning that there could be a surge of executions in the coming months in Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Missouri, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. Uh, is that accurate? Um, I would say it's possible given the, the pandemic slowed down a lot of executions, right? Other than the federal government's um, kind of execution speed through, right? In the kind of July to January process. Uh, but there were very few executions carried out during the pandemic. And so as we have, as vaccination rates have risen and as we have started to take steps to return to normalcy, it's possible that states may be pushing to execute. Um, although, you know, I, I would point out Arkansas, I think tried to do this in, let me say 2011 actually. Um, they had a, their drugs were about to expire. They wanted, I think, to execute something like eight people over an 11 day period. They ended up not doing nearly that many. Um, it puts a tremendous strain on correction staff to carry out executions. And I, that was one of the major concerns for Arkansas was, you know, what they were at also asking their employees to actually do. It's a bizarre, piece of propaganda work that they've got us calling them corrections staff. I'm not sure what they're correcting. Uh, what, what are they correcting and what is the case for whether you agree with it or not? What is the strongest case that people make for keeping capital punishment in place? Sure. I think, I think in my view, I think there are two, two arguments that I see as maybe strong for, for capital punishment. Well, three. Okay. One is the argument that it's contemplated expressly in the Constitution, right? The Fifth Amendment refers to uh, capital crimes. Two is our concerns about future dangerousness, right? There are people who argue the idea that there are some people who are just kind of too dangerous to, to keep around, even in prison. Um, and the third is the idea that 
justice sort of has to be done, this sort of eye for an eye retributive um, thing that, that we owe sort of victims and their families the right, the opportunity to have um, have closure from, from violent crimes, right? That, that it, it's, sometimes victims' families want that and it's detrimental not to let them have that sort of closure. But that first argument, it's in the Constitution, sounds like a legal argument, not a moral argument at all. Yet the Constitution also has amending the Constitution in the Constitution, right? Uh, And the the second argument, uh, you can't, you're you're in danger, even if they're in prison, uh, seems pretty dubious, uh, given that it's a prison (laughs) that engages in the torture of uh, isolated confinement uh, for many people. uh, and the third one sounds like o- open barbarism uh, and deferral of, of a society's laws to individuals for the sake of revenge. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't see those as particularly strong arguments, personally. No, I don't think they are either, right? I mean, you asked for the, the strongest ones I could think of. I don't think, I, I'm not convinced that capital punishment is, I, I don't believe capital punishment to be sound on legal, moral, ethical, like you name it, right? Um, I mean, my scholarship doesn't exactly, I think, make a secret of that. Um, I, I, you know, those are were the strongest things I could come up with, uh, like kind of immediately, yeah. um, but I don't think any of them are particularly strong. And, and what about the case for abolition? I, I mean, wouldn't we be advancing as a society? Wouldn't we be ceasing to educate people that murder is the cure for murder and you should kill people to prevent killing people and so forth if we were to join much of the rest of the world? We, I mean, the U.S. state governments and federal government were to join much of the rest of the world in in moving beyond capital punishment. I mean, I- I think abolition of capital punishment matters certainly in terms of joining the rest of the world, right? Um, but there are a lot of reasons to abolish capital punishment. Um, first is we don't actually, the evidence is weak. There's really not much evidence that capital punishment actually deters. Um, two, there is evidence that people can change, right? It, it, you're not the worst, um, as, as Brian Stevenson has said, you know, famously and repeatedly, right? You're not the worst thing you've ever done in your life, right? Um, the third is an argument I explored more with my co-author, Brandon Hasbrook, um, who writes a lot about abolition issues. Um, and we explored that a little bit in the nation piece, which is that capital punishment has historically been a vehicle of racism and racial oppression. Um, you know, I discussed this some um, in my, my piece uh, about abolish, abolition of capital punishment in Virginia. There were capital offenses for black people in the United States, in Virginia, that didn't apply to white people. Um, a huge disparity. And South, if you look at, you know, South Carolina's own statistics that are on its Department of Corrections site, um, South Carolina has executed dramatically more black people in the 1900s than white people. Uh, the, the numbers are in the nation piece. It's really appalling. Yeah. In a, in a life got time long ago, I was a reporter at a newspaper in Culpeper, Virginia, and reported on the case of Earl Washington, who was a, a mentally challenged, poor, uh, rural black man who was questioned by the police and couldn't try his very hardest to come up with anything that they wanted him to say, but couldn't, couldn't produce a piece of evidence that was accurate. And they kept asking him things like, this was the shirt you were wearing, wasn't it? And he, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, and and this was just openly how it was done and the white jury convicts. Uh, and you have to wonder, would such a nonsense case have resulted in a conviction if the guy had been white or educated or brilliant? You know, it, it, it's just, it, it just seems like built in racism without ex- anything explicitly racist. Um, sure. I mean, and, and capital punishment has igno- has been, you know, acknowledged even, even by the Supreme Court to have some certain statistical disparities in how it's carried out. Um, in a case called McCleskey versus Kemp in the 80s, the Supreme Court, it's a truly appalling case. I, I teach it both in constitutional law and criminal law. Um, 
It's usually the one that, that my students are ready to throw their books over. Um, the court acknowledges that there are racial disparities in, in capital punishment in Georgia in terms of um, especially race of victim. Uh, people who killed white victims were far more likely to get the death penalty. Um, the court acknowledges it and says, yes, but we also want discretion in the criminal justice system and we're going to keep it. So, and also, it, you can't prove that it didn't happen to you. You can't prove what? I'm sorry? Yeah, so with, with a, a, the racial bias claim in, in violation of the Equal Protection Clause, plaintiffs have to show um, a discriminatory purpose, right, that what was done was discriminatory against them on purpose, and then there's a discriminatory impact. And the court said, look, yes, st the statistics show there is discrimination in the imposition of capital punishment in Georgia. It appears to exist. But, you know, you, Warren McCluskey, he was the, the plaintiff in that case. You can't prove that you personally were discriminated against yeah. um, in, a, in a situation that it's virtually impossible to prove. Um, it's very difficult. So, I mean, it's, an, it's a thing that we've acknowledged, right, that there is this discrimination in the imposition of capital punishment and often in the justice system more broadly. And then touching on your point with, with Earl Washington, um, we're also not really good at figuring out who is the capital punishment supposed to be reserved for the worst of the worst. Washington was innocent, right? So that's that's a whole separate. But we're not good at figuring out who's actually dangerous, who's actually the worst of the worst. It's it's an almost impossible determination to make whether someone is, you know, never capable of redemption. Right. And of course, if you're doing it with, with missiles, you are praised and have a nice office in the White House. Um, what is the trend in, in capital punishment around the world and in the U.S., and, and what's the, the big development here in Virginia? I mean, the majority of countries around the world don't use it, right? There's a handful of countries that do. Um, the U.S. is one of the holdouts. States have started abolishing it. So New Hampshire did so in the last couple of years. And this year, Virginia's General Assembly uh, voted to abolish capital punishment and the governor signed the bill. So capital punishment is over in Virginia. Um, and this was a, a really huge, huge step. It took tremendous work by community activists, by capital punishment attorneys to, to bring us to this place. Um, because Virginia had not imposed a new death sentence since 2011. Prosecutors had sought the death penalty and juries hadn't, and defendants had either pleaded or juries hadn't imposed the death penalty since 2011. So we weren't using it. Um, and there, at the time when it was signed, there were two people left on death row. And so, I mean, it, it just kind of died away in Virginia. Um, we've been getting along fine without it. And, and yet there were prosecutors and police who wanted it, and it was used in a certain sense in that prosecutors would get plea bargains out of people by threatening it, right? Sure. That's, I mean, that's a consistent part of plea bargaining, though, right, is, is prosecutorial discretion to seek uh, high penalties to charge people with lots of offenses and used to negotiate um, plea deals. I mean, trials are, we don't have a ton of trials in the United States either anymore. Uh, the vast majority of convictions are secured by plea bargains. Yeah, and that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Not necessarily, right? It's going to depend on the individual case. Maybe for a defendant, a particular defendant, that that's a good a good outcome right it's going to depend on the individual case but the the reduction in trials is it's a little concerning sometimes when you you think about the fact that sometimes evidence is withheld and sometimes people who plead may waive their opportunity to appeal right um what do, what does the world think of the holdouts uh, and how does it affect uh, international relations and criminal cases and extraditions for the United States to have this ancient uh, practice? Yeah, the international law component isn't uh, totally within my wheelhouse, but what I do know is that other countries do not like this about us. They are concerned about it. It has 
uh, affected extraditions, right? We, we sort of have to promise we won't seek capital punishment before some countries will release people to us. Um, it's, look, I mean, it's, it's certainly inconsistent with um, part of the image that the U.S. wants to project, that we are engaged, we respect human rights, that we, you know, respect the justice process, that we try to be fair, that we encourage democracy. The, the cap, capital punishment, while lots of people might like it, it's, it's really sort of antithetical to all of those. It's highly secretive. It involves human rights violations, and it's brutal. At the end of the day, the state is killing people. Exactly. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Alex Klein, uh, where can people go? What should people do uh, who want to learn more and who want to move their state or their country uh, away from capital punishment? Um, one of the best resources out there is the Death Penalty Information Center. Um, their website has current news, um, including a, recommend, a discussion of their recommendation from a California commission on its penal code that California abolished the death penalty. Um, it has updates on executions. Um, they have a great, uh, they have tons of information there. So if you're you're looking to learn a little bit more about capital punishment, that's a really good place to start. Um, and I recommend keeping an eye on what your state legislature is doing, right? Are they changing their method of execution statute? Is someone in your legislature trying to uh, push a bill to abolish capital punishment? Um, you know, get get involved. Many states have uh, death anti-death penalty um, groups. Virginia had the Virginians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. Reaching out and getting engaged and seeing what you can do to and this is, is really important if that's something you care about. One of the one of those great rarities in activism, a group that succeeds and works itself out of the, the need to exist. Virginians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty uh, did such great work for so many years and I think uh, won't be needed anymore, right? Yep, and uh, here at Washington and Lee, there was a terrific uh, capital defense uh, student clinic run by um, David Brock um, that kind of <laughs> uh, helped sort of work itself out of yeah. out of actually being able to provide to do the work it was initially designed to do. They they started running out of things to do because capital punishment was uh, even at the trial level was so infrequent in Virginia. I, I would note also that rootsaction.org, a place where I work, has a button you can click to email your state delegates and senators and governor and say abolish uh, the death penalty as other states have done. Uh, we've been speaking with Alexandra Klein. Uh, she is a professor uh, in the areas of criminal law, criminal procedure and constitutional law and the death penalty. We will have links to her articles up at talkworldradio.org. Alex Klein, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.